If you haven't noticed, AI and language models are changing the skills needed to be a successful engineer. The people who are learning these new skills are getting jobs that pay up to $435,000 a year. They're creating apps using language models that generate millions of dollars at 90% margins with no employees. They're building features that took months in minutes, and they're using AI engineering. But there's a problem. These new AI models are non-deterministic, and English is now a programming language. What? And frankly, the industry is still figuring out the best practices of using them. However, we're now entering a golden era for AI engineers, and the ones that add to their skill sets will be ahead of the curve. There are six new AI engineering skills that are actually solving these problems. And in my opinion, every engineer is going to need to learn them to be successful. For those that are new to the channel, my name is Greg. I led a team of data scientists at Salesforce driving product analytics for billion dollar products. I've taught over 10,000 developers how to build their first AI applications. And now I'm in the absolutely privileged position to be making money doing what I love, building and teaching with others. This video is all about telling myself what I wish I would have known about working with LLM and some of these areas I completely overlooked. I'm going to outline the roadmap of skills that you need to be a successful AI engineer. Along the way, I'm going to highlight specific jobs that these skills are required for. I'll show you which experts are demonstrating these skills at a professional level, and I'll give you a list of resources to help you go further. And you invest in these skills, you're going to go off and build way more than you ever thought that you could. If you're remotely serious about getting into AI engineering, then you're going to want to watch the full thing. And by the way, every link and mention in this video is going to be consolidated into a one pager. If you want to get access to it, links in the description. The first stop on the roadmap of AI engineering is working with models. Now there's four popular models. This is going to be OpenAI, Anthropic, Meta, and Google, and each one has their own personality. Check out how Arjun Kanan, CEO of ResiDesk, puts it. We found that the OpenAI models tend to be the best analysts. The uh... Anthropic models tend to be the best writers, and the uh, Gemini models broadly tend to be the best detectives, if you want to think about it that way, right? Like they're great at finding needles in haystacks when looking at large contexts. The important part to understand is that most usage is going to be from text to text. However, there is text to speech, text to image, video to image, really any modality that you may want. And this is the multimodal part of working with these models. The next piece you're going to want to understand is how to work with these models APIs. Now, you're going to get very used to seeing openai.chat completions.create. But then there's also a lot of different model types, GPT-40, O1, Whisper, Hasana, HiQ, Opus. There's really a ton to learn. You're also going to want to understand streaming, batch processing, prompt caching, and assistance. Now, for each one of these on the document that I talked about beforehand, we're going to have definitions and resources to go learn more about these. Next up is going to be local versus open source. Now, if you don't trust OpenAI, Anthropic, Google, or Meta, well, then you can go run your own model on your own infrastructure. And popular examples for these are going to be with Open Router or OLama. Now, this is up to you. Now, in my opinion, what you're not going to have to worry about yet is with regards to model training, fine tuning, or model routing. Now, all these are very important, but I don't think that they're mission critical for an AI engineer right when they're starting. That's more of an optimization skill that they can learn later on down the road. For resources, if you want to learn more, check out my previous AI show and tell videos. And we have different guests that talk about their experiences with working with models. Now, another one I would highly suggest is the Lex Friedman podcast with the Cursor team. This is a bit more advanced look into model management, but I thought it was really, really good. And for people who to follow, I think Justine Tunney is absolutely fabulous for this. Now, heads up again, once more, this video is going to have a ton of links and resources. It's too many to put in the description of this video, so I have a doc for one of those. And if you want that doc, link is in the description for those. Next up on the roadmap to becoming an AI engineer is understanding the art of prompting. Now, I know a lot of people will argue with me and say prompting isn't serious or that it is a fad. But the way that I see it is with prompting, what you're really doing is just trying to elicit a behavior from a model. Now, today, that's English. Tomorrow, it might be something else. So let's not argue about the future, but let's agree today that effective prompting or the art of eliciting the behavior from a model that you want is a skill that's needed. Now, the art of prompting goes extremely deep as a practice. So we won't go into all the details in this video, but I'm going to share four techniques that have worked for me in the past. Now, the first one that I love is chain of thought or think out loud. This is going to be when you have the model 
explain its thought process first rather than have the model derive its answer early in its output. Next, it's hard to get performance from a prompt if you don't include examples. So make sure you include those. And then of course, there's a slew of other tricks like using XML tags or using pre-filled prompt messages. If you wanna find out what those are, those are on the doc as well. The next technique you're gonna to wanna to master is with structured outputs. Now it's interesting because computers do much better with structured data like JSON or tables. However, language models, they deal with plain text. Literally the output is a text that you have, the normal output. Now when the model responds back to you with valid JSON, well, then you can go and give that to other programs in your computers, or you can start to use other tools outside of your language models. And if you want your language models to use things like search queries or tools, or integrate with other systems, well, structured outputs are gonna be the way that you're gonna do this. Now, let's listen to what Thibaut says, and he sold his business for $8 million. Now he's heavily involved with AI. I think I think that the sentence that I typed the most is, output in JSON, do not output anything else. <laughs> so it's basically structured outputs only that come out from it. Yeah, and it's super reliable. I'll put a link to how to deal with structured outputs on the doc. Next up, as an AI engineer, you're going to come up to the question around how to do prompt management. And one of my favorite people to follow in this case is Jared, the CEO of Prompt Layer. He has a super cool perspective on this. It's interesting to see that we kind of all go down the same path. First, we're going to put our prompts right in our code. Then we're going to have .txt files. Then we're probably going to use an outside manager, prompt manager, like a prompt layer. For resources, we have a ton of these. First, I want you to check out this anthropic job. And and it's not current anymore, but it was there, that paid up to $375,000 a year for a prompt engineer or librarian. Hmm, a prompt librarian, okay? Next up, we're also gonna have a well-rounded introduction to optimized prompting, and I highly suggest reading Eugene's post. And for a huge deep dive, well, Elvis is the master in this one. He is the prompt engineering guy that I highly suggest going and checking out. And not only that, but we also have research directions as well. So if you wanna check out this paper that Google just came out with around prompting, links in the doc as well. The third skill on the AI engineering roadmap is around context or retrieval. So far, we've only been working with the model as is. That is, we've relied on the data that the model knew at its time of training. And this is okay for general reasoning, but what about when you wanna combine it with the context it knows about you? or your users, or maybe your role. The popular term for this is retrieval, as in, hey, we're gonna go retrieve data and bring it back to our language model so it can generate a better response. This is where the term retrieval augmented generation or RAG comes in, because you're doing generation with retrieval. But don't be intimidated, because this is literally just putting data in your prompt like you would for any other analysis. I do this all the time when I copy and paste information about myself into chat GPT. That's a really manual form of, ret of retrieval, but I'm still retrieving information about myself. The common way to do this is with matching relevant documents based off of a user's query. And what's amazing is that the most popular way to do this has been with embeddings and semantic search. Let's break both these down very quickly because they're super important. So embeddings are a vector representation of a body of text. If that sounds complicated, it's actually pretty simple. This is literally just a list of numbers, a vector, and we do this because computers can compare numbers a lot more easily then they can compare words. So if we have two vectors together, which represents two different pieces of text, we can actually compare those and do similarity metrics between the two. And then all of a sudden we can tell, hey, how semantically close are these two different pieces of text? Now, the other keyword here is semantic or semantic search. And this means that you're gonna be searching by the meaning of a word or phrase rather than the exact keyword. So all of a sudden ocean is semantically similar to water, which is very cool, right? And you'll see that there are immediate problems with doing vanilla retrieval. You'll find that users' queries aren't really detailed enough, or your app isn't returning the exact right context that you need to answer a question, or perhaps maybe there's too much fluff in your prompts. And this is where the world of advanced retrieval comes in. And there's techniques like enhancing users' query before it goes into your search, or improving the raw data chunking strategies, or improving how you split your long texts into smaller pieces, which is really your index strategies. For resources, I have an entire series on retrieval called fullstackretrieval.com. If you're interested to learn more, you can go check that out. There's also the Langchain documentation, which is a great place to get ramped up to concepts. Also, for those that are ready, I've made a tool called chunkviz.com that actually helps you visualize different chunking techniques. The next AI engineering skill that you're gonna wanna master is orchestration. 
This is when you go just beyond a single API call to a model and you start creating systems that work together in concert. Now the base levels of this look like working with an orchestration framework, something like Langchain, that's gonna help you adopt the foundation orchestration patterns. Now at, at its simplest form, this could just be chains, right? Chains are just when you sequentially put different model calls together. However, the advanced version of this is when you start to dip into the world of agents. Now agents may seem complicated and we're still arguing about what the definition of an exact agent is. However, my definition is gonna be similar to what Harrison Chase says. The, the, the core idea of agents is using the language model as, as a reasoning engine. Um, so using it to determine kind of like what to do and how to interact with the outside world. And, and, and this means that there is a, a non-deterministic kind of like sequence of actions that that'll be taken depending on the user input. In English, agents are simply language models that have access to tools and can decide when a job is specifically done. But I will say that the line is blurry for what is an agent, what is not. Let's not argue about it. There are jobs that will pay up to $435,000 a year for people who specialize in agents. Now in the world of agents, the most popular frameworks are gonna be LangGraph, Crew AI, and Haystack. Or in the no-code world, you have things like Lindy.ai, or Langflow, or Howie.ai. Another key important part with working with agents is gonna be around long-term memory. Now Langchain has a really cool blog post on this entire thing. However, I will say we're all still trying to figure it out. And I just posted a tweet that asked everybody what they thought about long-term memory and uh, there's no there's no solidified answers. For other resources I suggest checking out, Langchain just put out a state of agents report. Now this is around agent adoption within companies. So if you're looking to build a company, it would be pretty helpful to know what the adoption patterns currently are. This one's very, very cool. The people I suggest to follow in this world are gonna be Harrison and Alex. And by the way, if you wanna learn more about building simple agents on top of unstructured data, this is where my cohort comes in. Next up on the AI engineering roadmap, and this is arguably most important of all, is evaluations and observability. One of my favorite lines about evaluations comes from Jason. If you don't have evals, then you don't have a serious app. Evals are the unit tests of your language model applications. Now in regular code, it's easy to see if things break, but what about when your output is non-deterministic and really vibe based like language models are? Well, this is where evals comes in. People will stay away from evals. Well, because look how people stay away from regular unit testing in their code anyway, but really also because it's hard. It's hard when you want to thoroughly evaluate how good a summary is or how good a natural language output is. These things are difficult, but there's evolving best practices. One of the best resources I know about this is gonna be Hamill. He's one of the leading voices on evals and has a great resource to go learn more. Now on the observability side, this really breaks down into two different pieces. The first one is tracing. Now tracing is when you literally just start to log the different language model calls you have so you can easily debug for them. Now it's extremely difficult to dig into why your application performance has degraded if you can't find or see which LLM calls you're doing. The best way I've seen to do tracing is just hook into an additional framework, something like Langsmith or another observability platform. Make sure to add a bunch of metadata to your calls so you can easily pinpoint and deduplicate which calls you're actually making. On the other side, you're gonna wanna do cost management. Now, if you're not tracking your costs, then you're gonna be in for a bad time. Observability tools help you track every single LLM call and the latency errors as well. For resources, my go-to observability tool is Langsmith. They have a free tier, which is super easy to get set up with, and it's a really easy interface. For other tools, check out Gentrace and Arise. For product teams, I suggest checking out Autoblocks and Freeplay. The final skill that is needed to be an AI engineer is going to be the mindset. Now, I bluffed a little bit because this is really a meta skill, but it's really important to have a new mindset as you're starting to build with AI. Now, hey, LLMs give us a new capability to work with. And when you have new capabilities, you have new use cases. And what are these things even good for? Check out this sample of use cases that Elvis talked about. Sam Parr of Hampton, he put out an AI report about how all his companies are using AI, which is super interesting. And then I also put together an early signals. The next mindset pillar I want you to adopt is the build first and build quickly mindset. So check out what Tebow says about building quick. I, I would try to like uh, get the first ID that I have and start working on it right away and try to ship something uh, to the public as soon as possible. And I would I would tweet about that. Even if it's like, even if it's shitty and 
Even if it's not, not that useful, I would just tweet about it and expect a few of my friends to test it and give me feedback. The friction is so low that execution is more important than ever. The next skill is around understanding the emerging new tool stack. Now, I'm sure you've heard of a few of these and they could take up an entire video each. But if you're building front ends, it's too cheap not to work with something like V0 to get inspiration from. Then there's Cursor and Windsurf for if you're looking for a new AI powered IDE. And then not only that, Anthropic's projects is very popular amongst developers. See what Nicole Headley, CEO of Headstart, has to say about Anthropic projects. We're just top users of Claude and Claude projects. Uh, we love it. I think it's the greatest thing that has ever been developed. If he took it away from me, I would really struggle to run my business, which is probably like the highest NPS you can get for a product. The next mindset pillar is around scaling LLM apps. Now I got to attend OpenAI's Dev Day and I heard an amazing talk by Colin and Jeff of OpenAI. In it, they highlight three key areas of scaling LLM apps, improving performance, reducing cost, and reducing latency. And by the way, I packaged up all these links and resources in a single blog post completely free. Link for that is in the description if you want it. Now, if you've gotten this far in the video, there's a good chance that you're on your way to becoming an AI engineer. And I want to keep pointing you in the right direction. And this is only the beginning. The fact is, is that the landscape is changing so much, which really that should encourage you because there's never been a better time to build or be a builder who's actually executing. Now I'm going to be stepping a few students through these best practices hands-on through a course called Building with AIMs, AI Engineering Patterns for Scrappy Developers. The whole point of this is I want you to ship an app using these exact six skills. You're going to learn new tools along the way, and you're going to be surrounded by a cohort of builders. We're also going to have guest speakers from industry who are going to come in and chat with us about this. Not only that, but then we're also going to have AI credits. So you're going to get a speed boost to building with some of these tools in general. The cohort will be running ongoing. If you want to get more information about about that link is in the description and the doc as well.